Good evening, everybody. Apologies for the delay, but good evening. I hope you're all well, and thank you so much for joining us for this very important evening. I'm delighted that we are hosting this very special evening in which we'll meet the leadership and staff of Beth Shalom Holocaust Center and Museum in Nottingham. You know, with anti-Semitism, once again in the headlines, okay. the importance of Beth Shalom Holocaust Museum is obvious to us all. The center was the brainchild of James, Stephen, and Marina Smith. And this evening, we have an exclusive opportunity to see inside and hear the amazing story of Holocaust survivor oh. Janine Weber. I'd first like to thank Jonathan Taylor for organizing this event. To welcome Mark Cape, CEO of the Center, Richard Clark, Major Gibson Legacies Manager, and Nicholas Strauber, Educator and Outreach Coordinator. Our speakers have said they are happy to take questions, so please use the chat facility on Zoom. But I'm now delighted to be able to welcome and hand over to Mark Cape, CEO of the Best Shalom Holocaust Center and Museum. Mark, thank you so much for joining us, and it's over to you. Well, there. Thank you very much, Rabbi Chapra, and hello, everybody. Again, apologies for the mix-up on the Zoom link. Um, we, we're going to put up a whirlwind tour for you. I know this will be a place of... Um, I'm hearing all sorts of funny noises in the background. Um, uh, this is in place of a trip up up to us. We, ha we have reopened, but I know it's still a bit of a schlap from, from Boreham Wood to get there um, with social distancing and all of that. So... Um, I thought um, I'd start by explaining um, kind of what, 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 what we are, but also why. Um, and um, to pick up on, on the rabbi's point about um, problems resurfacing, um, there have been problems bubbling away um, with Jeremy Corbyn, and et cetera, for a couple of years, but now we're seeing it pop up in all sorts of places. So this man, for those of you who don't know, is Wiley the Grime Artist, who has come out with a whole stream of bigoted nonsense over the past couple of days. Um, everything we do, is not a history lesson. We are about, with our exhibitions and our learning programs and our holy of us, it's about relating what happened in and before the Holocaust to today. And this is a prime example of it. So I will be um, writing an op-ed piece in the Jewish Chronicle, Jewish News this week. Um, I'm going to get funding to um, specifically address the issues between the black Jewish relationship in the music business, because there clearly is an issue. There was a Radio 1 DJ who made um, more polite sounding comments uh, than this chap a couple of years ago, but it was the same underlying prejudice about Jews, money, and power. And there is no point us going on about the Holocaust and saying never again if we just shrilly complain, boycott Twitter, but don't educate. This is about education. So, um, to give you a little bit of an introduction of, of what we actually do, um, I'll, I'll tell you the history of the, of the place in a minute, but just to give you some bang up to date context really. Um, before the lockdown, the main issue we were worried about was racism occurring again on the football terraces. So for this year's Holocaust Memorial Day, we teamed up with all the leading Premier League teams, all of them, um, 24 of its biggest stars, and we made a film. And I want to show you the film because it, it explains um, more fluently than I can how we relate the past and the present. It's a two minute film. Today, on Holocaust Memorial Day. We remember. We remember those who stood by. Those who did nothing. Those that shook their heads. We remember those who said, this will pass. It will last. We remember those who didn't believe. Wouldn't believe. Refused to believe. Those who reasoned its only words, high spirits, harmless insults. We remember those who turned away, who stood by, who watched the deeds of others, but did nothing. We remember the good people, the decent people, all the regular people. Who didn't hate, but who encouraged and supported hatred through the power of their silence. And we remember their shame. Their eternal, regretful shame. Today, on Holocaust Memorial Day, we must remember. We must remember. Just why, when we see racism 
anti-Semitism, discrimination or hatred. No matter how small or seemingly insignificant. We can stand by. We mustn't stand by. We need to stand up. We need to stand together. 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 And we didn't run it for the Jewish community. We ran it for to try and make an impact on Britain at large. So this ran at football grounds, like you see here, um, where it's quite disruptive, as you might imagine. And that's because, I guess, if you ask me what I think we are, I think, first of all, we're thought provokers. We want to make people think again about their prejudices and think about how to be civilised, uh, because they say that any society that doesn't treat its Jews well isn't civilised. We did make an impact, we did provoke thought, um, from the Sun to the BBC and you name it, we were covered. Um, the football club themselves are right behind it. And we are now doing an education programme with the football clubs to address specific issues within football. Although we're not having to, as I said before, running one about within, for the music uh, industry as well. Um, and I have to say that, that being positively thought provoking is what the Smith family are all about. So to give you a little bit of the, the history that uh, Rabbi did touch on, um, this is an incredibly lovely, down-to-earth, humble Methodist family. Eddie on the left is a Methodist preacher. Um, and they went on a Holy Land tour in the early 80s. And that's a picture of from their, from their family album. And they ended up going to Yad Vashem. Um, it wasn't planned, but they went. And from that moment on, it changed their life as Christians because they thought the Holocaust didn't just happen out of nowhere, nor did it just happen in Germany from the 20s onwards after the First World War. They, as Christians, wanted to take responsibility, that's their words, not mine, take responsibility for the 2,000 years worth of anti-Jewish bigotry that created the conditions in which the Holocaust could happen. As everybody on this call knows full well, it wasn't just the Nazis. That made the Holocaust happen. And the, I mean, today, when we're talking about that grime artist talking about Jews having money uh, and power, he is, he is reiterating tropes that were first invented by what became the Christian church um, from the moment Judas Iscariot um, um, betrayed Jesus. That is where the association with Jews and money comes from. It was the bribe that Judas put. And that is what I mean about education. When you teach people like this guy Wiley, that it is about tropes that go back to things which the church invented. It's very hard for them to keep up their, you know, the, 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 the beliefs and prejudices. So we, on behalf of the Smith family, are here to tackle anything in contemporary society which is propagating the tropes that led to the Holocaust and which sadly, tragically, um, still continue today. And in fact, right now are horrific. I don't know if any of you have seen the CST report that's out recently, but the things that are going around on the internet are horrifying, both visually and verbally. Goebbels would be proud of the propaganda that's going on out there. So I think the Smiths themselves would say we are even more relevant in our mission right now than we were when they found it 25 years ago. Um, having said that, it was a magnificent um, and generous thing to do. They didn't come to us, the Jewish community, for funding. Um, they did it themselves and no one believed them. I just want to show you a very short clip of Kitty Hart Moxon, who's an Auschwitz survivor, um, who was talking about looking back on, on the impressiveness of the, of the launch. Over a four year period, the project came into being. There was this car outside and out jumped some young chap that I'd never seen. He said, um, well, you're one of the survivors, aren't you? And I've come to see you because I am going to open a Holocaust center. So my husband was there. And we both laughed. We looked at one another and laughed. And I said, well, that's a very noble idea, Stephen, but you're not going to make it. Lots and lots of people have tried and failed. And I've been to hundreds of meetings and nothing's happened. He said, you wait. When the centre opened, I was gobsmacked. I really was, you know. It was just amazing. I couldn't believe it. It, it was just an amazing sight. Uh, James, uh, James's brother Stephen 
was uh, became the first chairman of the UK uh, Holocaust Commission, and then got um, poached by Steven Spielberg to run the Shoah Foundation in in uh, LA, with whom we do a lot of work, unsurprisingly. James remains our life president. You can see him on the left of the picture there. Um, as a, I have to say, uh, he's a beautiful human being. He is humility itself, but so articulate about the genocide and so sincere in his devotion to fighting anti-Semitism, because as he says, it shouldn't be left to the Jews to do that by themselves. Um, he's in conversation there with Rabbi Shlomo Levine of my shul, South Hampstead. Um, um, and uh, we did a, a pop-up week there, so maybe, who knows, at some point in the future, we can come and visit you. We'd be, we'd be delighted to. Um, so that's the background, really. Now let's get into a little bit of the, uh, the programmes themselves. Okay, so even during lockdown, our education programmes continued. We... Am I unmuted? Um, so our education programmes continued, sorry. We've got two online secondary tutorials, one using the football film that you've just seen, where we're asking secondary school students, what does it mean to be a bystander? What are the implications of staying quiet, of saying nothing? The other is EDEC. This is a collaboration between Janine Weber, who you'll hear more from later, and a hip hop artist from America. And we'll explain a little bit more about who EDEC is and the uh, story there. So EDEC is used in a home office funded project, and we use that in areas that are susceptible to extremism. So our work with secondary schools and survivors has continued the whole way through lockdown. 12 survivors mastered Zoom, and they continue to share their testimony, taking part in question and answer sessions with over 2,000 secondary school students from all over the UK, including schools that we'd not worked with before lockdown. So our online primary tutorials are based around journeys that survivors took to the UK. And we asked pupils to send in their creative responses to what they'd heard. And what you can see here is a letter that was written by a primary school student to Bob Norton. It was another way we could continue to work with survivors through lockdown. So on site, we've got the UK's only exhibition that is aimed at primary school students. It's age appropriate and it's called The Journey. So this next clip is uh, James Smith explaining a little bit more about The Journey exhibition. What must it be like to flee to a new country aged only 10 years, leaving everything and everyone behind that you love? This is what the journey is designed to help us think about. When we opened the Holocaust Centre here, primary school teachers, as well as secondary, wanted to bring their pupils, but they were too young to learn about death camps and gas chambers. We felt we could, however, talk about the warning signs, the gradual build-up of exclusion of Jews from German society and the attacks by the Nazis before the Holocaust. We wanted it to be different, an immersive experience, starting here in the living room of a normal Jewish family in 1930s Berlin. We tell the story through the eyes of Leo, a boy about the same age as the primary school visitors that come here, letting you pick up his toys and see his clothes and handle the objects of an ordinary Jewish family of the time. So as you can see there, James is in the Leo's living room. It's an immersive experience. And when students come in into Leo's living room, the table is set for Shabbat dinner, so they can pick up the halakhah, the Kiddush cup. The schools that come to us are overwhelmingly not Jewish, and they've never heard of these items or seen them before. Um, one little story I remember from being in there is a group of, of 10 year olds asking me about the mezuzah and me explaining what that was. And one of the people's coming up to me after and saying how she thought it was a really lovely idea to have things in your house that remind you of what's important. And then she came over and said how much she liked the word mezuzah, having never heard the word before. So during, throughout the exhibition, where it's still set in 1939 and we're talking about the experiences of Leo and you know, the, the events of 1939, including the changes in, in education and what was happening during the November pogroms. So this next clip is James talking a little bit more about the November pogroms. Fear and intimidation swept the... Fear and intimidation swept the streets of Germany, culminating in November 1938 in Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. 
You can see how the Nazis used media publicly to whip up hate. So this next clip, this is um, some students actually experiencing the journey and giving us their reflections on what they saw. You just need to explore the whole room and find out something about Leo and his family. You just need to explore the whole room and find out something about Leo and his family. I really, really hate school. The teacher told everyone that I was Jewish. The teacher said to me, you should go to the back of the class and you should not sit with the other children at the game. Hitler didn't like people who didn't have blue eyes or blonde hair, but that should not be, it should not be like that because everybody is different. You can't say, oh, I'm special just because I've got blue eyes because we're all the same. This says Stein. Okay, so now we know this is Leo's dad's shop. We're going in there in a second, but something's happened to the shop sign. Um, they changed it, they changed it. Who's, who's changed it? The Nazi. Just wave goodbye to Morty and Betty. They look so sad. They say it's better for me to be away from all the trouble. Well, I love being with them at home than safe and alone. Look, this Leo story from his actual diary is really breaking my heart because why did the Jews, I mean, the, sorry, the Nazis do this? Why? Just for, just to get revenge on the Jews? Why? No point in doing that. You should be fair to everybody. It makes me feel really upset because if I was around there, I would see if I could stop this. But even if I'm little, I, I would try. I, even if Hitler would threaten me, I still would try. I would die in friendship. I have to say, you have to understand, as Nicholas said, everybody, that the, that the vast majority of, of the kids that come aren't Jewish. Many are Muslim and the kind of impact that that is, I promise you, unscripted, that you can get a young kid to, to act uh, like that. Uh, that that's just a, an example of the, I, I think, extraordinary emotional impact that the, the journey has on, on them. Absolutely. And for those schools that are not able to get up to Laxton and visit us, for the last three years, we've been doing journey outreach. So we've been taking this physical exhibition that we've been showing you and taking it out to schools um, across London and uh, up in Leeds as well. So, and having the same, the same kind of reaction of what you've just seen there. So, the 20, 2020, the summer of 2020, actually just a month ago, we saw the release of the Journey app. So, this physical exhibition that we've been talking about on a digital platform. So, again, we've just got a one minute trailer just to show you, to give you a taster of what that is like. I should just explain again that this is, I don't, I don't know if any of you um, use apps or, or, or are gamers. Um, but when it comes to educational apps, they are usually pale imitations of the real thing. Lots of Holocaust and, and um, Jewish learning programs are, uh, when they're online, are, um, you know, download the PDF from the website. This is as immersive and as emotive in its digital way as, as the walkthrough experience um, up at our museum. It is fully explorable environments, hidden objects, very emotive, huge production values, three years of research, government funded, it's a world first. So this is the trailer that just explains the narrative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
La, da, da. Always remember who you are. La, da, da, da. La, da, 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 da. Okay, so as an education team, we've created um, teacher resources teacher resources to go along with this, but also because of lockdown, we've created some standalone resources to accompany this app. Um, it's only been out for a month and the feedback has been fantastic so far. So our other launch this year is the Eye as Witness, which we launched in January at South Hampstead Synagogue. This is a real innovative project and it's developed with the University of Nottingham. The Eyes Witness gives the visitor the opportunity to step inside a photograph taken in the Warsaw Ghetto. So most of the photographs that we see are Holocaust, uh, the Holocaust are perpetrator images. So what this exhibition really does is it gets people to think in a different way about photography. So it gets them to think about why did the perpetrator take that photograph? What was it going to be used for? What was its purpose? So when you're, you can see there with the VR, so when you put the VR and you step into this picture, you've got a 360, you see the photographer, so you see what, what he chose to take the picture of and what was, what, you know, what was on the either side of it, so what was, what was he missing off the photograph, and that then opens it up to questions, why, why were certain things not being photographed in the same way? So, and the other thing is kind of how is this photographer putting across the victims? What images he creating uh, of the Jewish victims in the Warsaw Ghetto? So this was a pop-up exhibition that was covered by the national press and as I say at South Hampstead Synagogue it was hugely successful. The other way that survivors have been working with us during lockdown is live events. So we have been doing many live events across Facebook and across Twitter and to date those live events have been seen 25,000 times. So survivors have been uh, really helping us, they've got, got involved with Zoom and have been helping us in lots of different ways. So back to on-site, as Mark said, we're open now. So as well as the journey exhibition that you've just had a, a walk through of, we have our main exhibition. So this is an adult and older student exhibition. It's chronological, starting with pre-war Jewish life. And it, it, as it goes through, it really challenges the visitor to think, how do you go from a democratically elected leader to state-sponsored mass murder? We want the visitor to think about what was lost as a result of the Holocaust and what impact does that have on our lives today. The gardens. So, oh, there's a few pictures of the main exhibition, but the gardens. These are beautiful gardens and I've really missed working on site during this time and seeing the best of these beautiful gardens. We've got over a thousand white roses, which are dedicated by individuals, families and organisations. And we've also got your rose from the synagogue, which I think we've got a picture of there. So thank you for that. We've also got beautiful sculptures there in the gardens and we use these as part of our learning programmes. This next sculpture that you will see is uh, called Abandoned and it's by Auschwitz survivor Naomi Blake. And I think even the name of the sculpture itself lends itself to a lot of questions. And then finally, we encourage every student to, that visits to lay a stone on the children's memorial. And I've often been out there with 30, 10 year olds explaining to them this Jewish tradition of putting a small stone on a grave of a loved one. Each stone on this memorial represents a child that didn't survive the Shoah. So Karen, I'm going to hand over to you to talk a little bit more about the collection, about what's inside the museum. Thank you. Apologies for that, for the delay there. Hello, thank you, Nicola. My name is Karen Becher. I'm a senior educator at the center. And uh, good evening to all of you. A key part of who we are at the National Holocaust Center and Museum has to do with artifacts. So here in the UK, we hold the largest collection of artifacts. We're very privileged since our beginnings with the Smith family to be working with many Holocaust survivors. Uh, in an environment which is safe and respectful and to support survivors' testimonies. Many of them have donated a variety of, of items, photographs, documents, clothing, toys, books, many, many other uh, objects as well. Um, all of them to support survivor stories and help us to stop people denying that the Holocaust happened. The provenance of each object in our collections is researched thoroughly so we can show the truth with these artifacts. They're protected, they're conserved, and either are displayed at the, in the exhibitions or are, are protected in the archives. 
we're fast becoming a place where people are leaving their objects uh, together with the testimonies of Holocaust survivors. They tell a story about a particular individual or their families. Um, we have a broad variety of objects, as you see coming across the screen there. Some of them uh, uh, in the, the Holocaust exhibition, so showing evidence of the atrocities of the ghettos and camps, or like what you have in front of you, showing um, a, a method of survival, it became the currency of survival for a family. You see a gold bar that was hidden inside that, that shoe brush. Um, so families just desperately seeking to avoid being murdered. Uh, and many, many other objects, though, that are from, from the times before, before the Nazis uh, changed, met the changes that they brought in, uh, as you see right, right there. Um, an extensive collection of photographs as well. What I want to move on to, though, right now is to give you a little detail about two particular objects, which you see in front of you. Uh, was donated to the center by Holocaust survivor Victoria Vincent, born in 1923 in Jerusalem. This uh, little, what, just a little piece of paper, it's been taped together actually, we've preserved it the best uh, we can. It's on display in the Holocaust exhibition, documenting, you'll note there, uh, the dates and places where Victoria was held as a prisoner. There is camps, the journeys, uh, all documented there, incredibly dangerous, as she kept it in her shoe uh, all the time. So uh, we, all of us know just uh, what would have happened to her had she been found with this. She is, for me, just an ultimate witness on what, what we have here in front of us. We used it as well for the Eye as Witness um, exhibition on display. Um, it was at um, South Hanstead uh, Synagogue in January. Um, and here we have a picture of Victoria with Stephen and James. Victoria was one of the very first of the survivors to work with the center. Uh, so this is a, a really, really precious object that, uh, again, it's on display in, in the center, at the center. Uh, the next um, I'd like to show you, um, actually this is, uh, yeah, we'll move on a little bit. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about a man named Joseph Pearl. Here we have a section of his father's Sefer Torah. Now, um, it was hidden in a back garden by Joseph's father. Um, his father's name was Lazar. Now, Joseph was born in 1930 in Veliki Bochkov in Czechoslovakia. Now, nowadays, back then, Czechoslovakia, now part of Ukraine. Uh, an Orthodox family, they lived near the town's uh, synagogue. Um, and this uh, Sefer Torah uh, had been given to, to um, Lazar by his father, his grandfather at the time. The Torah was kept in the synagogue um, and was brought home every year for Simchat Torah, uh, where many friends and family would come to join in the festivities. Uh, but when uh, the Nazis took over in 1938 in Czechoslovakia with growing anti-Semitism, um, uh, Joseph's father was quite aware of the synagogues being destroyed and he, he took his Sefer Torah from the synagogue uh, and buried it in a garden in hopes that he'd be able to come back at some point and collect the Torah. Um, well, during the next few years, the, the family was, was separated. This is a family, by the way, of, with nine children and um, Joseph spent many years, a variety of camps and ghettos, witnessed his mother and four of his sisters murdered by one of the Einsatzgruppen. And eventually, uh, Joseph, though, survived, came to the UK. Years later, he learned um, that one of his sisters, this is Joseph, and Joseph as a boy, Joseph here in later life here in the UK, he learned that his sister, one of his sisters, Devora, had survived as well as his father, 1966, they were able to see each other uh, for the first time again after 26 years of being separated. Now in 1975, Lazar, he returned to Veliki Bochkov and he recovered uh, the, his Sefer Torah and he gave it to his daughter Duvora uh, to bring to England. She was coming to England, traveling, actually she was moving to to Israel and um, via the UK. And it was uh, her father's request to give it to, to Joseph. 
Uh, several of the parchments had to be replaced before it could be used in the synagogue. This section is one of them that at, at Joseph's uh, request to the Smiths, this is on this part section is on display at the synagogue. Right, so that's, that's giving you two examples of, of uh, objects we have on display uh, at, at the center. Um, so we've had now three, three um, live events, Wednesday, Wednesday evenings at 8 p.m. Uh, right now going on, Matters of Artifact, they're called. I've, uh, I've been a part of this myself, I'm hosting these live streams, um, highlighting uh, um, artifacts and speaking with the survivors uh, connected to those artifacts. I really uh, invite you to come along if you have time this Wednesday, 8 p.m. You find the information on our website. Uh, here's an example, Joan Salter, who just spoke last week. And this case you see there, that is another artifact on display at the center. And uh, we'd be really delighted to uh, have you join us at the center sometime. But, but that's uh, all pretty much now I have to say about artifacts. And um, Mark, if I could call on you. I'll take it back over. Yeah, I, the, the point I suppose I'd just like to briefly make is that um, these are not so much artifacts as, as preservers of the truth. They are linked, we take particular pride in linking them to um, our extended family of Holocaust survivors. So there's a triangulation between artifact, individual human being, and the overall meta horror of the Holocaust. It's, it, we all know how incomprehensible it is, and we see it as a way of educating by trying to bring it down to, and to distill the enormity of it down into individual human storytelling. So that means ultimately survivors. And Janine, if, you're, if, you haven't, if you haven't sent to sleep while well, uh, droning on for too long, you're gonna come on in, in, in a minute, only a couple of minutes away, I promise. But people like Janine are the absolute bedrock of everything that we do. Those artifacts mean nothing without the, 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 the human stories to which they are attached. And we take particular pride in, in, in nurturing those stories and bringing the human dimension to the fore. So much so that um, it says here we're guardians of the truth forever because what are we going to do when we don't have survivors to talk to? That they are the single most effective educational tool. Um, it is extraordinary when you see Janine and many of her cohort talking to a, an eight-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 20-year-old, um, and they might be talking about things other than the Holocaust. They might be talking about Brexit or Israel. They are role models. They change the way human beings think, and then therefore, I hope, um, behave. So when they're gone, or when they are around but not in the country, we have something called the Forever Project. This is the last exhibition we wanted to tell you about. It's an absolute flagship of what we do. Um, and I hope it's going to be, um, well, for us, it's probably the most important thing we'll do, um, say, in 25, 50 years' time. The Forever Project is, um, a, it allows you to speak to a Holocaust survivor and have a question and answer session, even when they're not there. It's a digital pre-recorded uh, projection of said survivor. Um, and you can put questions to them as if they were giving a talk, as, if, as you're about to with Janine um, this evening. So in terms of not only just recording the, the story, but the, the interaction that you can have with that survivor, that is the essence of keeping the story alive. As I, think, I think there are various studies that show that um, you know, if, you, if you do one-way teaching in a classroom, um, if, you, if you then allow the students to interact, then it increases memory retention by two or threefold. So this works at every level in, in terms of Holocaust memory preservation and educational impact. There are 10 survivors of which Janine is one who are currently a part of the Pantheon. Uh, we are converting them to online versions as well so that there is literally 24 seven access to these testimonies um, for now, forever, for generations to come from anywhere in the world. We uh, collaborated with uh, one of our uh, peers in the sector, HET, um, to commemorate the 75th anniversary of Belson, uh, where HET took the kids to Belson, and we provided the Forever Project testimony that went part of that. Um, Rini Salt, who's a Belson camp survivor, it was her, she's one of the 10, and, and our contribution is, is, the, is for the Forever Rini, if you'd like. Again, um, 
really cutting edge stuff. Um, we've developed some of this in collaboration with Stephen Smith over in uh, LA. Um, it's the same technology. We use it slightly differently pedagogically. Um, won't bore you with that unless you're interested later on. Um, but it is really impactful, important stuff for Holocaust education globally. And we're very proud of it and intend to do a lot more with it. You can see Janine talking about it in that middle section in The Guardian there. The last thing I want to say before, uh, Janine, is by way of introducing Janine effectively, is that um, when, when you say what are we, 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 we do very much see ourselves as a home, as a home for Holocaust education. Um, we're called Beth Shalom, House of Peace. So the whole homely spirit is very much in evidence. The Smith family made it homely and we're doing our damnedest to, to keep that spirit alive. Um, I'm thrilled to say that we are, um, I think in some ways, uh, we. Marina, James, Stephen, Eddie have, for some survivors, I think, been somewhat of a home from home. So the relationship with these survivors, I cannot emphasize enough, is absolutely critical. Um, they are part of the family album, literally and, and metaphorically. Um, this is Simon Winston on the left. Um, who's one of his artifacts, the scrubbing brush with the gold bar in it. That's, uh, that belonged to him when he was a hidden child in Poland. Uh, unfortunately, Stephen Mendelssohn there on the right has passed away. He was a kinder transportee. And they are there in Marina's living room with one of Marina's grandchildren. It, they, it is just a joy to behold the interaction between the Smiths, survivors, and us when we're allowed to get involved. Um, so there is, um, uh, I should say, New survivors coming into the family, uh, even now, this is Kurt Marx, he's 94, he's a kinder transportee, his testimony is recorded informally with, the, with AJR, but for him that wasn't enough, because I don't know if you can see the, for me this, the, the right side of the picture is clipped by the Zoom pictures, can you see the, uh, the clip of the, the, the guy in military uniform? Yeah. Um, that's his dad. And the thing that, that Kurt is particularly keen to talk to us about and, and have recorded is that his father, having fought in the First World War for Germany, was sent to a camp called Marley Trostinich in Belarus. Now, very few people, I don't know how many of you on this call have even heard of that. Um, it was a horrific place, like all the death camps were. There are zero programs in this country, and I think probably in the world, but certainly in this country, that talk about this camp. So we are determined to unearth whatever factual testimony there is about parts of the Holocaust that perhaps people don't even know about, as told by the human beings who were part of it. Now, there is nobody, nobody whose story is more moving uh, than Janine Webbers, who I am, uh, about to introduce you to this is this is her. Um, um, I am delighted to say that over the past few years she's become uh, a, a genuine personal friend of mine. I look up to her. She teaches me things without even realizing it. How she has be remained so artsy, cultured, optimistic, and gorgeous, I will never know. Um, but um, you'll uh, you'll get to see what I mean because I'm going to introduce her now. Janine, if you're there. Yes, I am here. Yeah. Hi, good evening. Uh, please tell everybody a little of your story. And then I think at the end, uh, if um, there's still some time, I'm sure people have questions for you, which um, hopefully you'll be pleased to take. Okay. Okay. You've got my pictures, haven't you? I have. Okay. I have. Uh, I was born in Eastern Poland in a town called Lwów and uh, Lwów was the third biggest Polish town. This is a map with the black spot Lwów and uh, there were a lot of Jewish people, nearly 200,000 Jewish people who lived there. Unfortunately, most of them perished in Lwów. It was very hard because it was, there were three communities, Polish, Ukrainian, and Jewish, equally divided. And uh, it, it was very hard. They were very persecuted by the Ukrainians as well. And I, I lived right in the center of the, ha of the town with my parents, my brother, two years younger, and my grandmother used to take care of me. And this is... a. Uh, the part, a picture of the town which I took when I went there about 10 years ago. And there is another one of the town. 
and uh, my parents were um, not very religious, but they used to pra be practicing Jews, like all the Jewish people in Lvov. And I used to go to the synagogue with my father on a Saturday morning. And we, of course, on a Friday, the Shabbat, we, we celebrated at home. And this is, there are some pictures of my parents. This is the first one. My, we are in a small village near Lvov on holiday. There is my mother lying on the grass, my uncle, her brother, Zelig, lying on the deck chair. Behind him is my auntie, she's about 14. And I will mention her again because she played a very important part in my life. And three sweet girls, and one of them it's me, you might have guessed, is the little girl who is smiling, who is holding the ball in the middle. That's me. I was, I was about between four and five. The pra, in the promise, my cousin Nina, who was about 10 months old, I will mention her again because she, her parents and her brother, they lived in the same two-story building. Their flat was on the first floor. Our small, very modest flat was on the second floor. And the other girl is just a friend of the family. And there is another photo, my father. And that's the way people used to dress. There is a third photo, which I have. And uh, this is uh, my mother holding my brother's hand. He's about two and I'm holding on to her, I'm about four. And we are again in a small village on holiday. Um, I managed to save miraculously. I managed to save some photos. I don't know how. I, I escaped from the ghetto and somehow I managed to save them. And then 1939, the war started. There was a division of Poland. The Russians came to our town. And uh, uh, then uh, we, I and my parents, we didn't suffer that much. I was seven and I was sent to school. My brother was only five. And the arrows point out to the Germans moving eastwards and coming to our town. No sooner had they arrived that the Ukrainians started persecuting the Jews. The next picture, please. And they, 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 the Ukrainians forced, if they saw a girl, a young woman in the streets looking a little like Jewish, they would force her to get undressed. And you see the mother is trying to protect her daughter. And there's another picture which shows an old Jewish man. They kicked him and you see the German officer on the right and the Ukrainian soldier, the Ukrainians, a lot of them, they joined the Wehrmacht. They killed, in fact, the Ukrainians, 4,000 Jewish people, even before the Nazis started killing them. So this was 1941, I was nine, my brother was seven. And I was in my flat one day when I heard the Gestapo screaming on our staircase. My father came running in and my mother said, locked the door and my father said, the Gestapo is after me. And he jumped in order to escape. He jumped from our second floor balcony onto the first floor and hid underneath. The Gestapo started banging at our door. My mother had to let them in. They didn't find my father and they left. And uh, I couldn't understand what was going on. At the, very soon, we were told to leave our flat. We were given a small room in a very small house because the ghetto was not yet ready. They were getting ready the ghetto. As you know, all the towns in Poland had a ghetto, usually an area surrounded by a wall or a fence where the, it was crowded, it was unhygienic, there was starvation, and there was killing and death. I will tell you a little more about it. 
but it wasn't ready so we were told, given this room not not yet not yet go back please given the room in that little house and my auntie who was 17 by then had a boyfriend a jewish man who spoke german and he had a contact among the german soldiers who would warn him if there was a roundup if they were coming to get people and uh, she came and told us and my parents dug a hole under the wardrobe which was in that small room where we were all four of us and when we heard the Gestapo approaching, my mother, my brother and I, we hid in that hall, but there was no room for my father and my grandmother, and they hid in the loft of the house. My cousin Nina, whom you saw in the photo, she was by now about four, between four and five, she and her parents and her brother, they too were thrown out of their flat. And, they, and her father and her brother hid in the loft. Her mother and Nina, my cousin, hid in the wardrobe. The Gestapo didn't find us hiding in the hole under the wardrobe. They didn't find Nina and her mother, but they found the others hiding in the loft. And I remember, hearing my grandmother screaming i don't know what happened to her maybe they threw her down the ladder they took them away and they shot my mother very soon told me that they shot my father and most likely my grandmother my uncle and my cousin nina's father who was about 12. Then uh, my mother didn't have any money, so my auntie managed to sell some clothes and she gave us some food, but the, the very little money, uh, uh, very food. And I remember my aunt, my mother eating just boiled potato, boiled, boiled peels of potatoes and everything else. She would give it to my brother and to me. Then again, my auntie said, they are rounding up people. So this time we hid in the shed, which was in the courtyard, this sort of kennels. And I was sitting there holding on to my mother and my brother was with holding on to her. My cousin Nina and her mother were there. And I remember seeing through the wooden slats, the Gestapo approaching. And I was so frightened that I didn't look at their faces. I just looked at the boots and for years I used to have the dream, the nightmare of these boots which coming to get me. Fortunately, I don't have this dream. We were told to move to the ghetto. Picture, please. And there is the ghetto at the very beginning where people were still well-dressed. I got this pictures, these photos from the German archives. And uh, there was uh, a, a soldier, a German soldier on the right, we don't see him here, with a rifle. You see there is a fence and he was standing outside. If they were alone, they would stand outside. They would go inside as a group to take away people or just shoot some people. They were hanging people. Next picture, please. They were hanging people and they were forcing us to go and look at them. They would leave them for a few days to create terror. People were begging. There was so much poverty and lack of food. Next picture. As you see, this little girl is hoping somebody will give her a piece of bread. Next one, please. This woman, you see her feet, and this little boy, so thin, uh, this woman begging for food, this boy, somebody's given him a piece of bread. We were given a small room in a flat for my mother, my brother, and myself. My mother wasn't well, and it was very dangerous to be ill in the ghetto because what they used to do, they would come occasionally and pick up the corpses which were lying on the pavement. And if they saw uh, or were told about 
somebody who was ill, they would take them away and just throw them on top of the corpses. And that's what happened to my cousin's mother. She caught typhus. Somebody told them uh, they were, she was found and they took her away and threw her on top of the corpses. She was still alive. My cousin Nina was there when it happened. She saw it. So my mother wasn't well and I knew I had to hide her. So I hid her first in the bed. And when the Gestapo came to fetch people who were ill, they didn't find her and they left. My mother became more ill and my uncle, in order to protect her, hid her in the cellar, carried her in the cellar of the building. I went to see her in the cellar, which was terrible. There were rats running around and my mother wasn't looking at me. She was looking at a distance and she didn't speak to me. And I was so frightened and so upset that I ran out of the cellar. And so my uncle and I asked him what had happened to my mother. And my mother said she had died. She died of typhus. And I was left with my brother. He was seven. I was just a few months over nine. My auntie told me to get out of the ghetto because they were taking away people. I, we managed, I saw that there was a hole under the fence and my brother and I, we crept through the hole to go to the area which was safe where there were no Jews. We walked all day, but we didn't know who to speak to and where to go. So in the evening, we decided to go back to the ghetto. When we arrived by the fence, there was a group of Polish children and they told us to give us, give them our coats. We gave them our coats and it was, you know, winter, it was very cold, but they let us crawl into the ghetto. You know, in the ghetto, there was so much uh, hidden uh, hiding, one had to do hiding when I knew where, when the Germans, when the Nazis were coming and that was a problem. I, when I went back into the ghetto, I found my uncle. My uncle found another Polish farmer's family to hide. My most, my auntie and myself, he found two families to hide, my cousin Nina, who was alive, and my brother. We were hiding in the stables, my auntie and I, when the farmer came and he wanted to grab my aunt and my aunt became terribly upset and frightened and suddenly she got up and she ran out of the stables. I only learned later that it was sexual harassment and perhaps worse. And she, I was left on my own. They put me to a bed and they would bring me some food occasionally and I would spend time by killing, uh, uh, killing, uh, um, I forgot the name of it. Um, you know, please. yes. Please, can I please? Please and, and please. And um, I, uh, the, after about three months, they threw me out. I went back to the ghetto and found my uncle, who he knew quite a lot of Polish farmers, and he found a family to hide me and my brother. One morning, when uh, we were the the daughter of the family, who was about twenty, brought in a, a soldier, a German soldier, an armed soldier, or a Gestapo, I'm not sure. And I knew that they, she brought him to kill my brother and me, but for some reason he didn't want to kill me, and they killed my brother. He was seven and they threw me out and I managed to find a woman who 
took me in for a while. She didn't know I was Jewish. I knew I must never tell anyone that I was Jewish. And she kept me for a while, but then she said she couldn't keep me because it was too dangerous. I had with me the name and address of a young Polish man called Edek. Edek was a young Catholic man, and he was a friend of my family. I found him. He got up and took me, put, uh, put, uh, took me to a small place with a building and put a ladder against the building and told me to climb. When I opened the door to the loft, I found my auntie, my uncle, my auntie's boyfriend, 13 Jews, and I was the 14th. Edek was hiding 14 Jews. He is a hero. He risked his life to doing, doing that. He was the night watchman and caretaker of the convent. The nuns didn't know anything about it. I, we at night, they would come and dig a hole under the floor of the stables in my night. We all went down that hole. There were six planks and chairs, so we had to take it in turn, lying on the plank or sit on the chair. There was nowhere to move. It was very small. There was very little food. My auntie would go out at night and she would bring some food the next night. And I remember eating slices of dry bread chopped with chopped up raw onions and I thought it was delicious. I stayed in that hole for a year. You know, it's very hot living on the ground. And after about a year, my auntie said to me, it's too difficult for a child to live in a hole. And she got me some false papers and we went to the Polish committee. And they gave, of course, they didn't know I was Jewish. And they gave me a letter to go to a convent. In that convent, they kept me for the night. They said I was too ill to stay with them. They gave me, they bought me a bus ticket and I went to Krakow. I found an orphanage, another convent where there were children. But I wasn't happy there because I couldn't, didn't know the Catholic prayers, so I was worried that they might find out. And also, I could hardly walk because I hadn't used my leg muscles for a year. And when one day a priest arrived and he said he had a cottage and he could take in four girls, I asked him if he would take me. And indeed, he too, he took me and three other girls. He was very kind, but we slept in bunk beds and the, I slept in the lower one and the top one, the girl was, would wet her bed. So I wasn't very happy there. So one day when an elderly couple arrived, they said they would like a girl to help them in the house. I asked them if they would take me and that is how at 11 and a half, I became Made. I worked for them. I worked for another Polish family, another farmers. They were all peasants, really. And uh, they sent me to church. And there is a photo of me. Photo, please. Oh, this, I and mean, it's not on this photo. This is a photo of me I have, uh, as a, which I went to church as a communion. When I arrived in that village, I wrote to Edek, but nobody replied, and I thought my family was dead. But my auntie, as you see her on this photo, came to fetch me six months after the war, and she took me. Uh, to uh, put me to a, a, a home, an orphanage for Jewish children who survived hiding of false papers where I met my cousin Nina. But you know, after the war, there was a lot of antisemitism in Poland and local people, we, we, our home was in Zakopane, a well-known winter resort people knowing that there were Jewish children, they would throw stones at us and at the house. So people decided to leave Poland. Photo please. 
and we left and we went to France. And when we arrived in France, my auntie said she wanted to go, go to the French university and stay in Paris. And the people in charge wanted to take the children to Israel. And she said, what do you want to do? Do you want to, take, to go to Israel or do you want to stay in Paris with her? And my cousin and I, we both wanted to be with her. She put us in a children's home for French children, French Jewish children who survived uh, like I did hiding or false papers. I went to school, my education is French, my language is French, and of course, English as well. When I was 24, I came to England just for a few months to improve my English. I met an Englishman, we got married, and I'm still improving my English. I have two sons and two grandsons, and I love them very much. I try to teach my sons next one, to teach my sons to be tolerant, not to persecute people who had a different religion or a different color of the skin. And this is me when I was 14 in Paris, and that's a summary. And uh, have you got a photo of Edek? We don't, I'm afraid. I can find one. It was after my photo, but it's because I have a photo with Edek. Edek. Now the sto that story is quite incredible. I lost sight of him because after the war, when my auntie came, we there was so much anti-Semitism, but we decided to leave Poland. And I lost sight of him and I didn't know, I, I didn't have his address, I didn't have his name. And I've always wanted to thank him, but I've never been able to. So I even asked BBC to try and find him, because I only knew his name, Edek. And Mark Cave, when I met him, he said he will help me to find him. And it turned out that Edek was his cover name. It wasn't, he was in, on, in the underground, part of the under, Polish underground. And his name was the Polish name. And he didn't uh, keep that name. So I found him, but unfortunately by then he wasn't alive. He died when he was quite young. And uh, however, he is in Yad Vashem, his name is there, so I'm glad of that. And because I, thanks to him, and perhaps to my auntie as well, who died last year, I'm still alive. Thank you, thank you very much. Janine, thank you so much. It's, it's, you know, it's always incredible to listen to you share that story, an incredibly difficult story. So thank you for giving up your time and, and going through it with everybody on the call. Can I just ask you, Jadine, before we open it out to questions, you, you started to talk a little bit about how your story has influenced the things that you say to your own children. But it's not just your own children, is it? Because I've heard you talk at Beth Shalom many times. So when you're talking to people, and you come to the end of your story, what do you want them to go away with? Well, when I talk to youngsters, to, edu to for instance, students, I always mention that we almost be understanding, not to be frightened of minorities, because after all, we are all human beings. We are very similar in many ways, even if we have a different religion or a different color of the skin. That's what I usually finish with. Absolutely, a really important message for people of all ages to go away with. So yeah. we're going to open it out to questions. Um, Rabbi, if I can come to you first and ask you to, to put your question to Janine and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll look at the chat box and see what the, what the audience are asking. 
Thank you, Nicola. And Janine, thank you so much for, for sharing your story with us. You're not just a survivor, you're an absolute hero, inspiration. And, and can see, we can all see how, how traumatic that is for you and painful of you to relive and retell that story for us all those years later. And it's moving to hear you tell us the story and it's humbling as well. You know, the last few months, um, people have been complaining about the conditions we've been living under, the isolation and the, and the lockdown. And yet to hear how you lived and you survived and you went on to build a family and a life and to show hope and, and confidence for the future is, is, is just an absolute inspiration. So we cannot thank you enough for sharing your story with us and we wish you good health. My, my question is this very simple question. It really sort of brings us back to the beginning of this evening, which is, uh, you don't sound like you're someone who lives with hate in their heart. It looks like you're, you're someone who's been able to move on with their life and been able to take the terrible experiences you've had and lost your experience to teach others and bring better, to bring better things into this world and better attitudes into this world. H how do you feel when you, when you hear the news you know, only just this week and, and the last few weeks, unfortunately, anti-Semitism again is in the headlines, right to the top of British society with, with the Labour Party and then with this, uh, this uh, rap artist the other day. H how do you feel? How do you respond to this? I am very frightened of what is going on in this world. I'm very frightened of uh, anti-Semitism, racism and... Uh, I'm very sad also to know that there are still people, innocent people being killed. And in some countries, the Jewish people up to a point being persecuted. And that's why I want to continue speaking. And I will continue as long as I live, because I think people, for people it's important to know that what happened to innocent people, what happened to my little brother, they would kill children. And that's not, it's against the law, it's not allowed. So I will continue speaking and have the same message of tolerance, of not persecuting people who are different. Thank you. May God bless you with Thank strength you. to continue this such important work you do. Thank you. We have more questions, Nicola. Do you want to take those questions? Yeah. Um, Jonathan, that's a really interesting question that Jonathan's put on here, Janine. So the question is, how much do you think the Ukrainians were active together with the Germans in rounding up Jewish people in Lvov? Well, as far as I know, they were very active. They, you know, in get in the camps there were they were capos in in the ghetto they would come and start rounding up people taking them away so, because in Lvov there was a concentration camp Janowska people don't know about it but at first they started sending people to do a slave labor, but quite often they would just shoot them. And in Eastern Poland, like Sobibor, there were death camps and Ukrainians played an important part in helping uh, to persecute the Jews. They started from the very beginning, as soon as the Germans came into Lvov. Okay, thank you, Janine. It's a really interesting one because obviously the, the, the you know you, the Germans, the Germans, and I think you're right in what you say, aren't you? That it's important that people know that there was collaboration by you know in the other countries as well. So thank you for that question, Jonathan. Okay, um, question from Johnny, Janine. What do you want your legacy to be? Well, <laughs> my legacy. It's a difficult question. I, I, I wish that it made people in more humane. That there are still, I know it's minority, but there are still people who are unfortunately anti-Semitic. And I wish they could be more understanding. And they were just more humane. That's what I would like. That's my wish. I wish that all the killing didn't go on as it go well, goes on. There are still genocides and wars going on in many countries. 
and I'm very worried about it. Thank you. And it comes back to the, the, the you know, how we started this session about the importance of education. Um, if we've not got any other questions, then Mark, I am going to hand back to you then to okay. sum up for us. I, um, I found the, the, um, the picture of EDEC, Janine, so let me just flash it up on the screen. Um, we did all that work together, we might as well show people the fruits of our labours, eh? Oh, that's him. He, he must have been very young on this photo, maybe 20 or 21. <laughs> He was late twenties. He, it's, we, we tracked him down, didn't we, to a university young yeah. girls in yeah. Krakow. Yes. Um, and it actually from his diploma. Um, obviously, he was a mature student because he went back to study after the war. Um, oh. Studied theology. Um, as you say, he unfortunately died tragically young in the seventies from cancer, from pancreatic cancer. Um, this is the certificate. Um, um, that was given to him as being one of the righteous among nations uh, oh, in his yeah. in, presented to um, posthumously obviously in 1997 to his sister who was uh, the nun at the convent um, that was responsible for the farmland where you were hidden by him so she was in cahoots with him again very very brave lady so these people are true what we call upstanders rather than bystanders went out of the way part of this is extraordinary i mean um, can you imagine hiding 14 jews and you know we were not very far from a place where they were germans my aunt told me when she would go out at night to buy some food she would hear the dogs barking and he never, never, and he was caught on two occasions. He never betrayed the group of people he was hiding. What courage. Absolutely. This was, um, this is, this is, um, I mean, his real, his real name, I should have said, as you probably saw on the certificates, was Franciszek Rzotki. Exactly, yes. Uh, and this is um, his own personal testimony that he gave to uh, the authorities in Poland after the war that got passed on to the UN and I, we, we did a lot of cross-checking. Um, this was the final uh, piece of documentation that proved that he, that the guy who was uh, Francis Rzotki at the um, uh, uh, Yad Vashem was the EDEC that, that rescued Julian and 14 others. Um, it was a Herculean job of translation. The documents were in terrible shape, as you could see there, uh, and uh, it was in a particular form of Polish dialect, which made it that much harder. But we got there in the end. So um, I, I, I hope it provided a little closure. For Janine, these are priceless documents, which are now we, we add to the to Janine's you know, whole collection. So I suppose really, um, um, to, to summarize, um, Janine and, and other survivors, we, we admire you, we love you, and your, your testimonies, your artifacts are all part of one, one indivisible um, uh, memory that we will absolutely preserve um, um, for generations to come. Uh, we would love people to come from Bore and Wood up when, when uh, God willing, uh, it's, it's okay to do so again, come to us. We can, of course, come to you. We do lots of outreach work um, with shuls, with schools, um, with whoever will have us. Um, we're very passionate about it, um, but about, I think, above all, making a difference. As Janine talks about, wanting to see peace being humane, there is no point treating the Holocaust um, by putting it in a dry, dusty old history box. It is, the Holocaust is now, it's happening it's all the trends are there and, and it's our duty to keep Janine's and everybody else's stories alive and related to all the unpleasant stuff that's going on today. Um, if we can't come to you and you can't come to us, you can learn with all with this with pleasure, with online, with all the digital tools we've got. I guess we're quite a weird combination of homely rural charm and some quite cutting edge uh, digital innovation. Um, I feel like we've done a huge amount of talking. Uh, I, I'm sorry we've probably kept you longer than we intended to. Um, I can't hear any snores, so 
I hope you've got away with it. Um, if there are any questions afterwards um, to any of us about any aspect of what we've talked about, um, with pleasure, uh, Richard or I um, can field your, qu your, your questions. Our email addresses are on the screen there, and I can send them to the rabbi and to Jonathan afterwards. Um, um, I wouldn't be a, a, a charity guy if I didn't um, um, point out the, uh, the donate uh, URL on the website. If, if, uh, if, if you're able to spare anything to keep all of this going, it costs an awful lot of money um, to, to do everything that we've just described. Uh, and obviously we've lost um, a lot of income from uh, the site being closed for four months. But for now, um, I want to thank you, Rabbi, for letting us um, talk to your congregation. Um, I am in awe of it. I know you've got over 4,000 members and, and have been, uh, if not still are, the fastest growing. Um, I wish you strength and courage. I wish you all health. Um, and um, I'm Yisrael Chai. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. I want to thank you, Mark, and all your colleagues, to Richard, Nicola, Karen, Jonathan Taylor, again, for help organising this. And of course, our, our biggest thanks to Janine Weber for coming on this evening and sharing her incredible, incredible story. To all of you at the Holocaust Centre, please pass on our thanks to the Smith family. Of course, thanks can never be enough for what they've done. We are truly, again, so, so appreciative to everything that you all do there and for the inspiration they are to, to really continue educating people and to try and eradicate anti-Semitism and racism, hate and prejudice from this world. Together, we'll, we'll stand together and uh, fight this and uh, make the world a better place. So I want to thank you all again. And, you know, please God, the, the, the centre shall go, the museum shall go from strength to strength. And please God, one day, either you'll come to us or we'll come to you. But uh, keep, keep doing the work you're doing. It's such, such important work. And we are so appreciative, appreciative of everything you've done. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I, I'm sure you have enjoyed this evening. Thank you again. Please stay well, stay safe, and uh, join us again another time. Good evening. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And thank you, Richard, for Bariski, for sending me a new Zoom. <laughs> I managed to do it myself. I don't know how I set it up, but um, it was once I got it, it was quite uh, simple to do. Thank you, uh, Mark and Nicola and Karen for helping and for guiding me. Thank you, Mark, especially my friend Mark. Yes, thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Janine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good night. Good evening to all of you.